When Greta and I lived in Chicago a number of years back, I worked for a moving company, two men in a truck. You've probably seen them around. Each morning we would all meet at this tiny trailer on the edge of a parking lot in downtown Chicago, and it looked more like a scene from a Godfather sequel than, or a place where a Lutheran seminarian would be working. But nonetheless, a friend of mine from church got me the job. And so we would meet at this uh, parking lot every morning and we'd get our list of moves and we'd get a big truck and we'd hit the city. And before our first move, and actually before each move of the day, Andrew and I would pray together for the, for the families that we are about to move. We didn't pray with them in their presence, but you know, in the truck before we got out, we would pray for them. And our dream was to start our own moving company called Two Dudes in a Subaru. <laughs> A free intercessory prayer with every move. Right? We wanted to combine Christianity with our moving. But that, that communal act of prayer, we would sit in that truck with empty Coke cans and empty coffee cups, and we would say that prayer together. It really reminded me that this partnership that we had as Christians, there was a bigger purpose to it beyond a paycheck. Right? There was a bigger purpose to it beyond employment. Because the Spirit of God is in us, we're doing something bigger, actually, with our work. The famous college football coach, Lou Holtz, he once said, on this team, we're all united in a common goal, to keep my job. <laughs> See, this is the time of year when NFL coaches find pink slips on their desk. Right? When winning means positive employment status. So if you win, you keep your job. And of course, that's not limited to sports. That's most of work in life, right? You have to do your job or, or you get fired, and it, it makes sense. But this is often how the world operates when it comes to partnership, when it comes to at least professional partnership. If we're in partnership together, I need you to look good so I look good. I need you to look good and do well so I keep my job, right? But what if you couldn't lose your status because of performance? What if you already belong and the partnership itself is no longer a day-to-day -day grind to, to prove yourself, but it becomes a celebration of the one who has solidified your identity as son or daughter in the kingdom, and you can't lose it? It's no longer about looking good to keep or uphold your identity. It's about doing good from a place of absolute freedom because there is nothing you can do to change your identity as a beloved. From the beginning, God has invited people into partnership with himself, not because he needs partners, not because he needs to look good, not because he gets something out of it, but because he wants to give his entire self to a people, his whole self to a people, and the Hebrew Bible conveys very clearly from page one that there has always been only one faithful partner in that partnership, one truly faithful partner from day one, and that's been Yahweh, God, the Lord among us. There is a purpose to the partnership in this case that transcends give and take. Because God partners with his people to make his people look more like God. God partners with his people to actually change our hearts to reflect his heart in this world. And that's what, that's what it means to carry the image of God. It is to carry his character into the world. The life of Joseph is really a lesson in God making the heart of a troubled man look like the heart of God. Right? And he's a deeply modern character, Joseph is. You'll recall earlier in Genesis that Joseph is hated by his brothers. He's hated by them so much so that he's sold into slavery by them. Some of us, maybe some of you, know what it feels like to be betrayed by family. Right? Those who are called with the care of you as a child and they failed. Joseph lived in a 
foreign country with a language he couldn't speak among people he did not know. Now, some of you may know what it feels like to not belong, right? Joseph worked a job he did not choose in order to survive, right? God knows there are many in this world doing the same thing. Some of you may know what it's like to give up dreams and serve a career you do not love in order to provide for a growing family you could not love more. God did not plan this life for Joseph. This is not some predetermined script he was forced to follow, but it's the residue. A life of tragedy is the residue of the world's refusal to partner with God from the beginning, to take take Godship to ourselves and become like God. Your pain and mine is not a part of a plan. It's not a part of a predetermined script. But God will partner with you in the midst of your pain to make you look more deeply like God. If you want to be. He will partner with you. He is eager to restore the muddied up image of God in ourselves. For us to be carriers of his character in the world. The the heart that we see in Joseph in Genesis 40 is the new heart that God has given him. In the midst of the story, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the brokenness throughout his whole life. And Joseph himself is a prisoner at this point. You'll remember, he's a prisoner, but because of his skills, he's, he's uh, charged with keeping care over these, these two officials, a cupbearer and a baker. And these two men each have a dream on the same night. And the next morning, we see Joseph's heart. We see the new heart that God has put in him through a life of brokenness. And what does Joseph do? What does Joseph do when he, when he sees these two men? First, he pays attention. He pays attention to them. He notices that there's sadness in them, that there's depression. See, he knows depression when he sees it. He pays attention to the people around him. He doesn't ignore it. He's deeply present to those around him. And second, he gently investigates. He doesn't just stop with noticing the sadness. He actually asks them a question about it. Right? Why do you look so sad today? And there's a number of moments in the Bible where God asks a question. Like in Genesis chapter 3, for instance, when God is asking Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? Now that's not just a question of location. It's a question of spiritual and emotional location as well. Where's your heart? Right? We see God digging deeper. We see Joseph digging deeper, reflecting the character of God. And third, Joseph invites conversation. He digs deeper still. Right? He doesn't stop with the feeling. Remember in verse 8, the cupbearer and the baker, they both say, we both had dreams yesterday, and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. Tell me your dreams. We see attentiveness. We see compassion. We see invitation. Joseph looks a lot like a first century carpenter rabbi we call Lord, doesn't he? Right? If you look at the way Jesus talks to the woman at the well, his attentiveness to her, his compassion to her, his willingness to dig deeper with her into her real story, not to run away. That is the heart and personality of God. That's the heart of God. Yahweh among us. And he is putting that heart in you. And he is putting that heart in me. He put that heart in Joseph. That's our inheritance. Right? As one of the Australian, I have a, when I was back at Regent College in Vancouver in seminary, I had a professor who taught me the New Testament in Australian an Australian New Testament uh, scholar. And, and he used to say, when he talked about the, the living waters, which are our inheritance, the, the living waters of life, which God has freely given us, he used to say, this 
is your inheritance. When will you cash your check? Right? There is nothing you have to do. Every last drop of it is gift. So drink up. Drink up from this fountain. He is putting your, his heart in you, and he's putting his heart in me. This is God's heart shining through Joseph's life. And this is nothing like professional partnerships in the world, right, that are based more on performance and politics. This is a partnership ignited by a promise that God wants to be your God. That was his promise from the beginning. He is not begrudging in his love. He is committed to you. He's committed to you. And I love what Charles Spurgeon says about God's commitment, the permanent, the permanence of God's commitment. He says this, Charles Spurgeon, the great, the great prince of pe- preachers from the 1800s, he said this, where the grace of God really converts a man, he is not converted merely for the next quarter of a year with the possibility of falling from grace afterward. That is a human conversion which can ever come to an end. But if God converts you, you can never be unconverted. As conversion is the work of the Spirit of God, it is clear that it must need the same power to undo it as first did it. He who has made you a Christian will keep you a Christian. And unless one stronger than he shall come in and undo his work, you shall never go back to your old idols again. See, you can't lose him. So you have nothing to lose. You have nothing to lose. See, that's why the martyrs of the first century could face what they faced. Because they knew they could not lose him. Next time you notice a broken heart in your presence, next time you hear someone say they can't make sense of their story, Next time you hear someone ache for real life and long for a new world, know that their cry is the same cry as that of the baker and the cupbearer. Right? We have dreams, but there's no one here to tell us the truth. We know there's supposed to be more, but there's no one here to give us the truth of who that is or what that is. See, it's a cry of it's a cry out for meaning. It's a cry out for assurance. And Joseph, because of his story, because God partnered with him, is right in the place where he needs to be to be able to speak truth into their lives. Right? There's a great scene in the movie Signs. Have you seen that movie? About 20 years ago, by M. Night Shyamalan, it has Mel Gibson in it. Mel Gibson plays a... uh, a former pastor who is with two small kids and he's grieving the loss of his wife. And at the same time, there's an alien invasion. Right? <laughs> but it's really not about aliens at all. Right? I, I, I highly recommend this. It's one of my favorite movies of all time, Signs. There's a great scene in that movie where his, the, the character who plays Mel Gibson's younger brother, Joaquin Phoenix, um, his name is Merrill Hess in the film. And he, he plays a, his younger brother, of course, who has moved in with Mel Gibson and his family. So he's his younger brother, and he's a former minor league baseball star. He played in the minor leagues. And there's a point in the film where he is in, a, in an Army recruitment office. And the Army recruiter recognizes him, and he says, Hey, I know you. You're Merrill Hess. You're the baseball player. I was there the day that you hit that 507-foot home run. Man, that thing had a motor on it. Um, And he said, he says to Merrill, is that still the record? And Merrill says, yeah, it's still the record. I have the bat at home. And the recruiter says, "Um, man, why aren't you in the big leagues? making boatloads of money. And there's another voice at that point that comes from the other side of the room. There's another person in the room, someone from Merrill's past. And that guy says, he calls out, it's because Merrill 
has another record that no one knows about. Most strikeouts of all time. He has more strikeouts than any two players. And the recruiter turns to Merrill and he says, is that true? You have the strikeout record? And Merrill responds simply, it felt wrong not to swing. It felt wrong not to swing. It is terrifying to let people see God's heart in you because you cannot predict their response. But swing away anyway because there is nothing to lose because you cannot lose him. Swing away anyway because your performance does not change your status. God took a swing, didn't he? God took a swing before we even knew what was going on. He has consistently put himself and his name on the line and we have consistently let him down, but he is still here. He is still here and he has not let his people go. He risked everything and he gave everything for our redemption. He took a swing because of his faithfulness. Jesus on the cross, it looked like an absolute strikeout, a total failure. A complete tragedy, but it was absolute victory. Absolute victory. You know, there were 2.5 billion Christians in the world in 2019. 2.5 billion. And there are more now, just two years later, later, because of the growth of churches in China and Africa, right, where the gospel is exploding in those places. Most of our brothers and sisters in the faith look very different from us and speak a completely different language from us. But see, this is a sign of God's victory. It's a sign of God's victory that the gospel is exploding in the way that it is. It looked like failure 2,000 years ago, but it was absolute victory because of the faithful, persistent, generous heart of God dying like a criminal so that we could live as sons and daughters. There's a young man I see in the hospital. He's about my age and he's, he's dying. He told me the other day, he said, spiritually, I'm good. Spiritually, I'm good. I just hope God feels the same way. Right? And the answer to that implied question is that you are more good, you are more than good with him because it was never about your goodness. It's always been about the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, our true partner. It's never been about our goodness. God feels better about you than you can even fathom. The life of Jesus in history tells us that. He did it all. There is no professional kind of partnership in salvation. God does it all. He did everything. We don't have to wonder who he is or what he's like. We just have to look at the man on the cross. The man who gave his life for us, and that's all the data we need. That's the life that we need. It's more than salvation. It's sanctification. It's becoming like him. He's putting his heart in us. He is partnering with you, and he's partnering with me right now to put his heart in us. You cannot earn it. It is all him, because he is our ever-faithful partner. He's our ever-faithful partner. So let's pray. Gracious God, we are overwhelmed sometimes by the incredible nature of your grace, that you loved us before we could even say love, before we even knew what love is, and that you are putting your character in us. Lord, what else can we do but open up to you? We just open up our hearts to you and say, do what you will because you are good. You took a swing and you risked everything for us. So there's nothing we can lose because we can't lose you. So with that, we give you our lives. We give you our families. We give you everything because you are love. You are love. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.